Okay, we're now in recording mode. Let me clean my screen off, and we'll open up a new one. And one of the things that I really love the Digitizer program is it gives me a lot of options. It gives me some automatic options, and it gives me manual punching options. But even the automatic options still give me a lot of control. So we're going to start with bringing in an image and creating a design from it. And to do that, you're just going to go up to Image and insert image and i am more of a manual puncher but my opinion is if i don't have to punch something that doesn't take a great deal of skill or it can be done you know quickly and accurately automatically and i can just enhance the design or you know add some personality to it i'm going to take that option so we're going to go ahead and just do this little hip pets um bitmap again and then we'll look at a couple of other images as well. But most of us have access to a bitmap or a JPEG or a WMF image. Those are kind of standard clip art images or images that we'll find. Or if you scan um, an image into your computer, you know, you're going to end up with generally a bitmap or a JPEG format. So we're going to start with this image. It's, you know, looks like a very simple image, but it's really kind of a cute design. When I bring the image into the program, what I really like about this program is that if this is too large or too small, all I have to do is scale this by dragging on the image. It's one of the few programs that lets me select the image directly. To scale evenly and proportionally from the center, I hold my shift key as I drag across or drag this corner out or any of the corners. But you can see what's happening is it's scaling from the center, which is a lot easier than, you know, dragging one corner and then dragging another corner to scale this to the size I want. You know, I can just simply hold the shift key and it'll scale it for me to see if it's going to fit in who selected as well. So here's my image. Any image that I want to use an automatic process in for this program, I have to prepare. And the image preparation is great because it takes a lot of unnecessary things out of this bitmap. So I go to the image preparation icon and click on it. And it's up a little interface. And what it's asking me and what it's telling me here is that in this little image where I'm just seeing a few colors, um, there are actually 237 possible colors available. And while it doesn't equate exactly to the number of thread changes you may have, when you see, you know, the number of colors in a design, you should think in terms of the number of thread changes you may have. In this case, I don't really need 237 colors to make this design. And what my eyes are actually seeing are going to be the two blues, the brown, the orange, and then, you know, the face sections here on the little dog. So it's just a few colors. And the program's reduced it to five. I need to leave the white background as a color. And in this case, we have, like, white in the face as well. So, you know, five is a good color to keep. If you want a little bit more detail, you could add six. But you end up with some little details in here that you may not want. If you want less detail, you can say four and see what happens. Worst case, you know, you lose a color, like we've lost this blue here, and you think, no, no, let's just go back and add the five colors. So I've got really what I need here with five colors, so I'm just going to say, okay. And what the program has done is take out all of the rest of those 232 colors that were in this little bitmap that I really didn't need. So the image is prepared, and to use the automatic process, I have several options. One is to just click to design, boom, it's just done. But if you note, there's a, like a little black triangle at the bottom of this icon, and if I press and hold the mouse, a little fly out window opens. This is click and it's done, and the program makes all the decisions for me. This one with the little paper icon, like with check marks to it, means that I have a little more control. And since I tend to be a little bit of a control freak on digitizing, I always choose this second option because I want to pick my fills. So I'm going to go ahead and click on, you know, the second option that gives me the choice of some fills and look at settings. And this is kind of a neat little window because I have a lot of options. You can see here it's saying to omit the white background. And if you look on the image, 
the background grayed out, but so is the face area here because it matches the background. That's okay because we can create those sections very quickly even if we omit them here. In the fill colors, it's giving me the four colors that I need, the brown, the orange, you know, the, the two blues. I also have a choice here at the top on stitch types. If I auto select this, what that means is the program's going to look at the area based on size. And if it's small enough, it makes it a satin. If it's big enough, it makes it a weave fill or complex fill. And, you know, I get what the program gives me. I can always make changes. I can recreate the sections or I can change the fills in them if I want to. But there is a very distinct difference between a wee fill and what they call it a parallel turning fill here. That's your satin stitch. So I'm going to go ahead and say I want to do a weave on all of these right now. If I were going to add detail like outlines, I could say satin lines or just satin. And if you've ever used an image that has kind of like the wide black, you know, outline around it, you know, you end up with a satin fill, which is the second choice, or you end up with satin lines, which are a little more even, and you can always change them to a different line type. So this, you know, we would look at in a, a longer webinar. Um, at this point, I'm not really going to add any outline detail, except maybe on these whiskers. So just in case, I'm going to say satin lines, because I'd want to have a little more control here. Now, um, detail colors, it's not showing me any, so, you know, I'm not going to get those lines. Okay, those are going to be seen as areas, just so you kind of understand what's going on here. Not adding outlines, and I'm not adding any borders, which is a satin outline. So I'm just going to say, okay. And the first thing about how to fill this and update the design, and I have a pretty reasonable design, except that, you know, I still have those blank spots here. Well, there's another option in the program that you'll find you probably use a little bit more than you use this automatic process, and that is this icon here. It says click to parallel we fill, but if I click on the arrow, I've got a lot of options. Okay, this with the little, you know, hole showing means that if I click on, like, you know, a brown area in the cat, I would have a hole here and a hole where each little piece is. This means if I click on it, it's just going to fill it with no holes. And the perfect example of when I would want to use this is going to be right here. See where the little eye is? That eye is small enough that I would not want to have a hole there. I would just place that little eye on top of a fill. So I would use this option. And even though the colors here are the same as the background, because they're enclosed, when I click on them, I actually can quickly create those areas that were not created because, you know, we said don't create the white background. So those colors are now created, and they're in the wrong order in the design, but that's quickly fixable as well. Over here, you have this little object window, and what it shows is each little piece of the design that's been created, but there's a color button here, and if I click on the color button, it sorts everything by color, and you can see here's the white that I just created. I might want that one to stitch first, and I just left click and hold the mouse button and drag the white into position. So you can see I've got, you know, the white in place now, the brown eye is going to stitch on top of it. And for all intents and purposes, I have a pretty reasonable quick design. You know, there are some things that I would change on this if I were, you know, punching this, you know, quickly, but I wanted to show you the automation um, from a click, here you go, here's most of your design point of view. Now, something else that you have to consider when you make a design is what fabric you're going to stitch it on. And what's really nice about this program is that it gives me some options. So I'm going to just hold my left mouse button and drag around and, you know, make a big square around this. Select everything. When I select everything, I can change the settings for the underlay and the um, compensation and the stitch density very quickly based on what fabric I'm going to sew this on. I just simply go to setup and you can see it says choose a fabric. So if I choose a fabric and maybe this week I'm stitching this on, um, you know, like fleecy items, it's going to give me some backing tips here. 
But the way that you know that this has changed is very, very easy. Let me get one of my little tools open here. And I'm going to draw just real quickly an arrow to where I want you to watch, right here. Okay, watch that number change once I say OK. Now I've chosen fleecy items, and there is my stitch count down in this left-hand corner. When I say OK, the program makes the appropriate adjustments to the fill pattern or the um, fill density and the underlay based on that fabric type that I've selected. You know, if I decide next week I want to stitch this on, um, you know, something different, I just come up here and say, you know, really, you know, I think I'm going to do this just on cotton and say, OK, you can see that each count is going to change again. So those are some of the neat little automatic features in the program. Now, something that, you know, I do want to show you is, let me clear these off. Um, I had mentioned, you know, that's the, the real quick automatic portion. And I do want to show you, like, on this blue section here. You know, this has a hole to it where the eye is. And remember I said that's too small, really, that I wouldn't want to have a hole there. Well, you know, the program automatically does that for you because that's, you know, how the automation works. But what I can do is I can pick the pieces that aren't going to work for me, and I can quickly recreate them just using this little automatic select or autofill tool. And if I don't want any holes, I just come over here and click. There are no holes now, and then I just need to move that into a new position. And I'm going to just drag it to the top for right now. And you can see I've gotten what I wanted with no holes. Now, if I wanted to put a hole in this, because, you know, where the wing is, that area may be large enough to create a hole. I have a lot of neat little tools that I can edit and quickly do something like this as cut a hole. I select that, and I come in here. And I begin to just trace where I want the hole to be cut. And I hit enter and enter a second time. And now I have a hole where that wing is. So that maybe something that's as large as that wing is stitched double. So do you guys have any questions so far? Let me go ahead and open up the mic real quick. Um, do you guys have any Do you guys have any questions on what you've seen so far? I've been taking notes. I think I can get that far. <laughs> Okay, I just wanted to check with you now. That is on the automation. I'm going to show you a little bit on the motifs, which I have a lot of fun doing the motifs um, because I can create whatever I want to create. So we're going to go ahead and go back into mute mode, and we're going to go into the motifs and then a little bit of lettering. So let me mute you. Okay, so... This is our quick little design. I can save this. You know, I would, of course, you know, take this section and do exactly what I did over here and get rid of the little travel line between there, just so you guys know. But this design's on um, our Facebook page and on our website for free download in its finished form. So I just wanted to let you know that. I'm going to go ahead and create a new file, and I can leave those other windows open if I want to and just go here and go back to any design I want. You don't want to leave a lot of them open. You just, you know, maybe want one or two that open at a time. Um, we're going to go ahead and look at motifs, and I just have such a good time with the motifs because um, I refer to them as stress busters because when you are working on something, inevitably there are those times kind of stop and think about what you're doing, or maybe you're just not getting it to do what you want to do and you get a little tense and it's never good to be tense so i always go over to this little gallery option and in the gallery i have quick little design pieces and if you scroll down you've got some that are maybe a little more bannerish these are little fill types 
And then you've got some that have some solid fills. And these are in your, your book. If you look on the online book or if your software pa package came with the finished manual, you'll see what these look like in a little more detail. The ones that have like these outlines around them generally are satin stitched of designs. So I'm going to go ahead and select the flower. And why I like the motifs are I've got this little outline, and if I left click, it places the anchor point. That's where it's going to start. And I can rotate this in any direction I want. When I left click a second time, that places the second anchor point. And then I immediately have another second. And it's the same thing. If I wanted to start here and make a border, I just left click and I can place this any way I want. The other thing I can do is if I right click, it flips this and I still have that option of moving this any way I want. So those are why the motifs are fun. One of the reasons. You can see you have a lot of little designs here. Some of these are intended for fills. And some of these are intended to be a little more substantial. And I can keep clicking to make a long border, or I can flip these around. But what else is nice is I can select each individual section here. And they're, you know, grouped together. And I can always just change the color. And, of course, there's always undo. Um, for example, maybe you want this to be two colors, so you come in here and you say, let's make this, you know, red and green for a nice Christmas border. Or even if I didn't flip this around as I was making them, I always have the option to come in here and select it and flip it at this point and drag it down and, and rearrange these things. And it's nice because they're grouped together so the pieces all stay together. So that's kind of the basics on the motifs and gallery division. But I want to show you what else you can do with these. Um, we're going to go ahead and start with just a fill. I'm just going to grab, you know, one of these fills. And if you notice, remember I said if there's a little triangle, it's got a fly out menu. If I click on this, I can automatically go into a motif fill. And that works for any of the manual punch tools. Or if I've manually created a design, I can always select the section, um, like in our last design, like the cat body, and maybe put a motif in there. But I'm going to go ahead and just use squares right now. So here's my big square, and that is my default motif. If I come up and select, you know, the little select tool, which is the pointing finger, you know, anything that I've just created will be automatically selected. Or I can always be in select mode and select the area I want. This little sheet of paper is called object details and there's a couple of ways to get to this this lets me get to my stitch settings to change things change the fill in this example i can use the icon i can double left click and it automatically opens it or i can right click object details so there's all kinds of ways to get to the object details and what the object details is let me control what's going on with a particular area, or if I've got multiple areas selected, I can change more than one area at a time. In this case, we just have one area. And you can see here's my default motif. And here's the drop-down menu of, you know, the basic motifs. Now, unless I'm sitting here looking at, um, you know, the book, I, I really would have no idea what these are. So the program has this neat feature so I can figure out very quickly and very visually what these are, and that's called Select. And that takes into the motifs that we were just in. So I could select a different one, like maybe I want to fill it with a squiggly line. I just say Make Current. I get a preview here so I know what it's going to look like, and I have a layout option here, and we'll look at that in a second. Um, if I want something beyond what you know is basically here the program comes with a default or a second option i shouldn't say default option of black work which gives me some very neat black work fills some of these work great for fills and some of them work phenomenal for fills and lines and some of them work very very well with just lines or very large areas um you know this is this little flora design is in the black work and you can see what it looks like in a little preview window here. Because that's all, it's not always 
the most accurate preview is going to happen here. So you can, you know, do a couple things. You can say, okay, and you think what's going on. Or if you don't think you're going to like the list on this or what you see here, you can always click on the layout button. It gives you this kind of yellowish, you know, kind of highlighted background, and that's showing the area. Um, and it's a little offset from the actual area because it's a layout screen. Then it gives you these three blue motifs. And these are going to let you do different things. Like you can scale just by dragging on this and scale those all to size. You can also rotate. If you left click a second time, you get the rotate. You can just rotate. And you see how everything moves, right? You can also drag these, you know, the, cent the motif on the corner is going to let you resize and rotate. These are going to let you span your columns and rows. And you can see I'm moving that. So I can move these so that they're a little offset and a little closer together if I want as well. And if I have the black select box, it's always resize on the motif. When I like what's, you know, in the preview here, I can hit enter. And I can change how this fill is going to look, how it's going to stitch. You know, really, I can come up with almost infinite patterns. If you have made changes that you don't like, that's what these little undo arrows are for. You can undo and come back in here and say, you know, I'm not really sure I like that. And, you know, select and move them around again if you want. or rotate that whole fill. And when you hit enter, it should take you right back into that. And I'm not sure why my screen is misbehaving. It could be because we're recording. But that's another feature of the motifs that I really like. Let me go ahead and close up this and open up a new screen. And we'll just go back over here and the motif square. Okay, in the motifs, what else I can do is I can create my own motifs. You know, if I have a filled area and I want to fill it with something I've created, you know, I'm going to select it, of course, and then go into the, the, you know, motifs. And I'm going to show you some of the ones that are already created. And I'll show you how easy it really is to create your own motifs as well. I just come here and you be in this drop down menu. I have Bernie's motifs. We had some wing needle classes. And here's my, you know, digitizer classes that we've done. I'm not really sure what's in all of these, but um, these I think we were doing a little bit of wing needle in. These we were using for lines for an heirloom class. But, you know, I can select any of them for a fill. And you can see what that's going to look like. And there's my fill. So, you know, I have a lot of options with this. Let me show you lines real quick, and then we're going to look at how to make motifs. Each one of these motifs can be used as a line also. So there's my line. I'm going to select it, of course. And I'm going to say, really, I want this to be a motif run line, and it gives me the default line. If I want to go into something I've named myself or into the black work, I just use the select button, and I can come in here and select the motif to make mine as well. So Now, if you guys have any questions, type them in the little chat box. And once I show you how to make your own motif, we're going to stop again and see if there's any questions. Let me close this and get a fresh screen. And I'm going to show you how easy it is to make your own motif, which is kind of neat. I can make it from anything. I could make it from lettering. I could make it from something I've digitized. It could be multicolor, um, although with multicolor, you have to handle that a little different if you're, you know, making a line or a fill. Um, so you can do a lot of different things. You can make this, you know, two different things. You can make a lot of really cool things. And I'm just going to use the, the motif or gallery to create a new motif or resize a motif. Um, some of my favorite pieces in this are, I like this little piece, kind of a fun little piece. And if I hit escape, you know, I have just one piece. And I want to go ahead. So, you know, here's my new motif. I'm going to go ahead and 
and chill as well. You know, that's a little bit bigger. So, you know, let's go ahead and go with a wee fill on this because it's much larger. And then I want to maybe add a smaller one or a different motif. You know, I can do either one, but we'll come down and we'll add this one. Okay, so here's my second piece and, you know, these two very distinct pieces, right? If I'm doing a motif, I might want to make sure that they're touching so there's, you know, fewer jumps. But here's my two very distinct pieces. When I go to make my own motif, like if I would want this for a line, um, this would be a little large for fill, but if I wanted it for a line, this would be just a fantastic line. I select everything, and I can do that a couple of ways. I can hold my left mouse button down and drag around to select, or I can come up here and say select all. Okay, now these are grouped in these two individual pieces. They're, you know, grouped together already. If I want to make a motif, it's in the embroidery section. You can see where it says make motif. I don't necessarily have to group them together again or group these individual pieces. I just select make motif. It says where do you want to put that motif? And I can make a new folder if I wanted to, or I could just add it to an existing folder. And I'm going to go ahead and add it to the existing folder that we have and just get large line. Now, what's really neat about the way it saves the motif is it's going to save this motif at this size. So when I use it, it's at a default size that's going to work in, you know, whatever I select. I can always resize it, um, but if I made it this large, I generally want it to be that large. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, um, remove functions is a neat little feature too, you can take out like, um, you know, some functions that you don't need. Like if you're gonna scale this very small, you probably don't need underlay. Um, you may not need some of the, the different um, stitch functions like color changes. You can, you know, take out some minor things here. I'm gonna go ahead and leave it as is and just say, okay. So now that is saved as a motif. I'm gonna delete it from my screen just by pressing the delete button. And the program is thinking about this at this point. And you know, it's motif for me. It should give me a motif save sign. So let me go double check that. Hold on. Okay. We'll double check and make sure that it's still there. And let's make sure our motif is there real quick before we move on. So I selected the line I made. I'm going to change it to a motif. I'm going to come to, you know, the folder I saved it in. And let's scroll down and see if it's there. And if I don't get the motif saved, it could be that it didn't save it. And it doesn't because I think it actually didn't. But so there's a message you need to watch when you save these. Let me do that again real quick. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I think... Um, the internet here may have like blipped. Can you guys still hear me? I'm going to turn the audio back on just to make sure you guys are still here. Can you guys still hear me? I hear you. Okay, yeah. good. I hear you. Yeah, we, I had, hear you. Um, we had like these massive windstorms yesterday, and all of a sudden everything got very, very quiet, and the computer started acting funny. I was like, oh, I don't think that's good. So, all right, so we're, um, I'm going to go ahead and mute us again. I just, okay, so when you save this, you need to get a 
message, and, you know, I may have told you something wrong, so I do apologize if I did. Let me go ahead and group these. And then go into embroidery. I should get a message that says, you know, motif created. Um, and let me save it again. And I don't know why I'm not getting that message at this point. I should actually be getting it. Do something very simple and see if it does it. Hmm. It could be the recording or, you know, I'm not really sure why it's giving me a bad time. Okay, there, I need to right click. I apologize. So let's go back to this. When I right click, I get the, you know, motif actually saved for me. So there we go. I've got all of our mouse functions back and I've made my line. So we're going to go look for that motif we just saved. If you are making a motif and you don't get that message, um, then you know it's not been saved. It generally takes an additional click to save that. So it's in my motif now and I have my line. And I go ahead and select, um, you know, my details and change this to a motif run line and then I'm going to go ahead and wait for this to show up but <laughs> and I, I think it's either the internet maybe because the wind storms or something but let me restart my program up oh, there we go uh, so here it is here's my large line it did show up um my motifs already so I can scroll down and find you know the one that I just made and they don't always save the way you think they're going to so sometimes you have to kind of look for them, you know, just so you guys know. Um, and this one happens to be up in here. I just wanted to show you where it was. So once I say make current, you know, there is the motif. It's going to be in a line. And you can see the sizing and the spacing that that was originally created at has been saved. And what the advantage is to that is that, you know, really, if you make something large, it has a certain fill pattern and it has, you know, a certain um, underlay sometimes to it, but that maintains what you made. Like scaling this motif because I put that fill on it would maybe make it too dense for a good motif. And in our regular webinars, we do an actual class on motifs to explain how to make these and how to control the settings better. But I wanted to point that out. Sometimes making things smaller isn't the best thing to do. So I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, here is my line. And I can just keep creating this line over and over and over until I get rid of the motif in the program. So the motifs are kind of fun, but I had mentioned earlier about the dress by part. And sometimes when I get a little frustrated with something that I want to do and I just can't figure out quite how to do it, picking motifs is just a good way to do it because I can come in here and get something instantly. Even if it's just something on my screen, it makes you feel a little bit better sometimes to see something created when you're frustrated with, um, you know, working with the design. And, you know, I always tell my webinar groups, don't get frustrated when you're working, get up and walk away if you need to, or, you know, play with the motifs and, you know, come up with something on your screen that just relaxes you a little bit. So do you guys have any um, questions? If you do, go ahead and type them in the chat. And if not, because we're, you know, coming up on um, that half an hour mark, I'll just go ahead and go on to the lettering. You guys are good? All right, in the lettering, there are a lot of neat features with the lettering. First off, you get something in this program that, um, you know, hands down, these are some of the best digitized fonts that you'll ever see. You get true type fonts, but you get pre-digitized fonts as well. And for small lettering, that's very important. The lettering in this program gives you several options. And we're going to start off with some very basic things on the lettering. This is your lettering icon 
this is the information about the lettering. And it shows on this screen, but it also shows when I click on this icon to create lettering. I'm going to go ahead and open the lettering. And you can see anything that has an outline to it like this is a pre-digitized font. And these have been done, you know, by professional digitizers. So when you come up with some of these fonts, when you want some small, they're automatically designed to work well. You can see even the Helvetic, Helvetica small fonts. And, you know, this is going to help when you're doing 10 millimeter or smaller lettering. So this is the standard size, 10 millimeters. Here's your width, it's 100%. And this is going to space the lettering. And we'll look at that in a minute. You also have a slant option, which lets you turn the pre-digitized fonts into an italic type of font. So we're just going to type in one line right now. And down here I have these justification things. If I have more than one line, it's like your word processing program. You can center the lettering, you can align it to the left or to the right, or you can space it out in a specific area. These are text paths, and we're going to look at those as well. And this letter sequence, I'll explain as we go through the lettering a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and just say OK at this point. And when you create lettering, you have to place the lettering. Right now it's just waiting for me to place a mouse click to see where I want this lettering to be. One left mouse click, and my lettering is created. What's about this is if I want to scale this a little bit, I don't have to go into the lettering settings again. I can just drag it, and it adjusts the density of the lettering because it was created in the program. So there is you know, my first line of lettering. If I want to make changes to the existing lettering, I can change the size here, like maybe I want it to be you know, 50, which to give you an idea, 50 millimeters versus inches, it's a little less than two inches on the lettering. Um, well, right about two inches, I, I guess I should say. 100% font width, that's the width of these letters. I can come up here and quickly say, you know, I really want this to be 350 font width. And you can see how wide this letter, you know, those letters now become. So these are just kind of my quick little controls here. This is a quick little control on the text path as well. I could quickly select that and you can see it, you know, places it up and down. And let me make this a little bit uh, smaller so you can actually see this. And I can do this for multiple lines of lettering as well. You know, this because um, you know, this text path wasn't originally created. I think it'll, you know, kind of throw the lettering onto a text path, but this icon is really something you should create as you do the letters, and we'll look at that as well. So I'm going to undo and go back to just the, you know, regular lettering. If I want to make changes, like I misspelled something or I want to add another line, I can double-click on this, and it'll open up my object details. And here's all of my stitch information, and I have a tab called Lettering. When I click on the lettering, I am back to really where I started, and I can make changes to the font. I can add things. I can, you know, correct things. Um, or I can just come up and add a second line. And, you know, really say, okay, you know, I want this to be centered. Say, okay. And... I've, you know, very quickly added additional lettering to this. When I'm working with the lettering, I'm going to go ahead and delete this lettering and, you know, start new lettering. I also have option to true type fonts, which, you know, give you some very interesting things. You have, you know, all different true types of true type fonts on your computer, and you can add from our sources. Um, some of them are, you know, fonts you can purchase, some are for free on the internet. Just be careful where you, you know, get your fonts if you do go to some of the free sites on the internet. And I'll explain how the true type lettering works. True type lettering, when it's made, is an outline. And the program is looking at these outlines to be able to create the font. So if you have a, a true type font that has not been created with good outlines, maybe because it's free and you know somebody's learning, or because it's going into print and they don't really think about you know outlines for digitizing. You won't always get what you want. 
this program does a very, very good job of handling the true type lettering. Like this font here is, you know, a little complicated. And, you know, let me just type in a real quick word. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it. This handles this type of lettering very, very well. That's a true type font. It handled that font, you know, very well for as complicated as it is. It depends on the font, like I said, how it's going to handle. This is not too, too bad, but sometimes it'll handle, you know, like something, they're called wingding or dingbat. Um, it'll handle some very complicated scripts, um, complicated letters, but not always. You know, this one in particular, it does. Um, this must have been created very well. But this is really meant to be all capital letters. And making it that small would probably not allow it to stitch properly. So this is a font or this type of font where you have a lot of detail, you would want larger. But you can see the program handled this font very well. It created the lettering for me. And that's one of the nice features of having true type lettering. You can get something that's a little more personal or a little more decorative to your fonts at times. This program also has monogramming, and it's a little more traditional. This is your monogramming icon. This is your fancy monogram. It's it really kind of like a script monogram. Um, here's the size. You know, it, it's the same thing. I can always resize it, or I can just enter how, you know, wide I want this to be. This is the width of your lettering, and I have a spacing option here. And the spacing option allows me, you know, to increase the space between the letters. In this case, I'm just going to leave it at zero. And same thing, I just type in what I want, and I click, and I get my monogram. Now, if I stretch this out, you know, I can create this to as I want. Okay, and that's a nice traditional script monogram. It has a couple of other options in here as well. So I go here and I say, okay, let's make a fancy monogram, or maybe I want, you know, a traditional point monogram. The program automatically takes the letters and creates them in the proper sequence. And you can see with the letters, it's, you know, angled to be properly, you know, these are already pre-digitized, so it assigns the letters in the proper order for me. And the same thing with octagon. I'm going to go back now to the traditional monogram real quick. You can do this with any of the monograms, but I'm going to use the traditional one for this. And I'm going to go ahead and scale it a little bit larger. And there's the traditional monogram. I have this neat feature called insert border. And if this is going to be a more traditional monogram frame or you know, some of them are a little more modern looking, like the little heart, but um, I'm going to go ahead and, I oh, will go ahead and select the heart. Um, border width, how wide do I want this to be? I'm going to say five just to make it a little more dramatic. Make it current, and there you go. I've got an instant border. I can size this border, and I can also change the color. So that's a little bit on monogram. Now, if I wanted to make this monogram a little bit decorative, the program does things with letters like this. It, it kind of groups them together. And it groups them together, I think, a lot because there's pieces to this. But it also keeps your design in order. I can always come in here and say, you know, edit and ungroup. What that does is allow me to access these pieces. And if I hold, you know, the control key, I can select multiple pieces, or the shift key, I'm sorry. I can select these multiple pieces and change the color. You know, so I have a lot of options with the lettering and um, in this program. Now I'm going to go back to our standard lettering for a second, too. Let me take this off of here. And we kind of went through a little bit of the lettering, but I wanted to show you the monograms as well. My you know, you can see you know, fancy monograms is actually one of the pre-digitized fonts. I'm going to come down here and just kind of select 
Oh, I guess we'll select this one. Okay, if I make three lines like this, I can put these on any text path. This text path is the one that you need to draw. And really, to have the best effect, you should use this text path as you're creating the letter. Um, it's a lot easier to create this line than try to create after you've made lettering. But what's neat is even if I select this type of path, and I come in here and say, OK, I really want the lettering to fit like this. It takes those, you know, three lines and tries to shape them on each individual line. I probably should have made that a little more wordy. So let's hear. You can see I can just come in here and edit as I want. Okay, so now I've got these three lines and they're on this wavy text path. And when I say OK, even after I've come in, you can see what it's taken these three lines and space them. The more, you know, the more words, the better you get, you know, that effect on the wave. Um, go ahead and scroll these up here a little bit. I go, go resize them all together. I have some neat little features, even for just mine, I have some neat little features for this. One of them is to go to the editing or the reshape. And I can come in and kind of select the individual letters. So you can see this one line where these are all shaped to remains the same. Okay, this, each individual letter here, or this here, here, you know, controls just that line. And it goes around. Okay. These little diamonds allow me to move the each individual layers around. So I can space the words out however I want. What's nice about this program is I can also, you know, quickly reshape the line if I want to, but I can use these little arrows on the side to reach where the letters go, the size they are. I'm going to go ahead and undo These are quick little controls. See, you can see the template moving. It's going to space the words around that line a little bit better. Each individual letter can also be selected. And you can see I get these little, you know, edit nodes on this letter. And I'm going to zoom in, so I'm going to press B on my keyboard and then drag a square, and that lets me zoom in. So I can actually reshape each individual letter if I need to. I can change the fill on an individual letter. Um, if I select the color, it changes them all, but I still have some options I can do to change an individual color as well. Just wanted you to see what happens when I select that individual letter. This little node here, I don't know if you guys can see that, let me annotate a little bit. Right here lets me drag the letter around. This little node right here does something different. So this node lets me drag the letter or the line around, I'm sorry. This diamond lets me move that around, but it gives me these squares and lets me reshape or resize one individual letter. I can make it wider, I can make it more narrow, um, you know, I can make it taller or shorter, or I can resize it proportionally for each individual letter. And I'm going to go ahead and make this letter fatter and taller so you can see it. Let me see so you can see the whole screen again. Okay, that one individual letter. Now I can also do something else with this individual letter. This arrow, anytime you see the arrow, is not going to relate to the letter. Okay, those are relate to the whole thing. The boxes around a selected letter relate to that letter. And if I left click a second time on this particular letter, 
I may left click off it and go back. I can go in and I can change that letter in particular to a different fill. These little clear boxes that you see allow me to rotate. So I'm just going to rotate it that way. And allow me to skew or angle the letter so I can really with some very, very creative lettering if I wanted to. I can also do multi-line lettering. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out and just open up a new little file. Um, lettering is kind of neat. And because we all tend to do some form of lettering, you know, I want to show you the text path because there's two things here in the lettering. There's that ability to create multiple lines. Actually, there's a few things in lettering. Create multiple lines, edit each individual letter, um, give it a different fill. You could give it actually a different font too if you want to put a lot of time into it. But these are text paths. We did this one. These are, you know, your circle text paths, right? Counterclockwise or clockwise top or bottom is what it's saying. When I want to create lettering, I guess it would help if I actually put some lettering in there. <laughs> Hold on. It lets me drag the circle. And you can see this little line, you know, going either straight up and down or straight across or at an angle um, is going to control where the lettering is placed. When I place that second click, it lets me drag, you know, another you know, circle, I guess. You can make this oval, you can make it very tight, you can make a perfect circle if you wanted to. Okay, so there is my circle. I didn't put any lettering in there, but I wanted you to see what that circle does. Let's go ahead and we'll just undo and go back to our lettering. And we're going to do the circular lettering. My first click is where I want to place that circle, and it proportionally scales. But what's that little line and what happens? I'm going to go ahead and place it in an angle. Well, I'll place it up and down first. I place that second click, and now it says, do you want to make an oval or do you want to make a you know, circle? And you have some choices here. We're going to go ahead and enter. And you can see it's placed it on top because I selected the top option. I want to scale this letter in a little bit. I change that to go into this edit, and I get, you know, like these, this is my start and my end, but I have like all kinds of neat little things so I can make this lettering go all the way around, space it. Or I can, you know, I drag it closer together. You know, I have like this little circle in, or this little square in the middle, which I can control the size very quickly by dragging that. And I can really place lettering very accurately around something using the controls in the program. Okay, so that's a little bit on lettering and a little bit on the automatic and a little bit on motifs. Um, you know, generally, when we do a webinar, we cover one subject and we cover it in detail. But I wanted to give you a little idea also about what the program does um, and some of the features that are in it, because we did have some people in the webinars that had not purchased the program. They were kind of deciding what they wanted to um, do, I guess, or what software package might work for them. If you have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and open them up. and that you guys can all hear me still and I can hear you. So are there any questions or anything you want to know? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> how, how about fun in the snow? Oh, yeah, you know, no, I'm sick of snow. <laughs> <laughs> and and you guys are up in my area, so I know you know what I mean. Um, yep, there was one thing I didn't show you, actually, about the lettering. We, you can do circular lettering and do those text paths. But see this little lettering art button? No matter what I put this on, when I do lettering art, I have 
you know, the ability to really re- reshape this lettering a lot of different ways. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Like, I would definitely put a, a fill if I were going to make it this big. But it gives you a lot of options, you know, for your lettering. So let me go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording so this isn't 